Uh, first guy I'd like to introduce is Chris Waite. Uh, Chris is with c -Core. He's a member of our Certified Professionals Program. Uh, he is a branch manager. He's a tech. He does a lot of field work. And Chris has done uh, a lot of cold weather fusions. So welcome, Chris Waite. We also have Rick Ponder. We saw Rick's promo video there at the end at the end that uh, we were trying to run through in that opening video. Uh, Rick uh, has got 30 plus years in the industry doing electrofusion uh, installations and training throughout uh, North America. Excited to have Rick with us today. And then, of course, we have our own Alan Ambler, professional engineer. Alan and Dan work closely with Jim Johnson to take Jim's base deck and prepare it for today. And then, of course, Jim Johnson is our primary speaker today, Chief Technology Officer with McElroy Manufacturing. Next slide. Uh, so, Jim, why don't you come on? Uh, so this is how you contact us, the various speakers today. We're also going to run this slide up at the end of the deck. Please know that this is a 75-minute uh, session. We will be done at 15 minutes after the hour. So that's a total of 75 minutes, 65 minutes from now. Next slide. Um, and I just want to reiterate, uh, training is critical. Uh, we have two of the leading trainers uh, that operate businesses as trainers. So Rick Ponder does Electrofusion. McElroy has a university called McElroy University that does training of all the distributors. So Chris Waite, one of our speakers today, is with a distributor. So McElroy's team will go out and train all of the people that you buy product from on how to do uh, fusions. And so Jim oversees all of that. Uh, and Dan, thanks for bringing that up on the screen. Just a quick survey of you all on the call today. We have over 350 of you on this call today. What best describes your knowledge? And Dan will run the answers to this in about 10 seconds. Jim, why don't you come on and tell us a little bit about yourself and what McElroy does? So, sorry, I'm trying to get my uh, survey off the screen. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter. Uh, my name's, again, my name's Jim Johnston. Uh, we at McElroy produce the uh, largest uh, product line of uh, fusion equipment in the world. Uh, we make everything from half inch uh, CTS size equipment all the way up through two meter diameter fusion equipment in fully integrated, in, in integrated and automated equipment and uh, sell throughout the throughout the globe. And as Peter said, McElroy University is one of our Great offerings for training on on butt fusion, sidewall fusion, socket fusion, and that goes beyond the distributor. We 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 train uh, operators uh, all across the globe uh, through that process as well, both in person and online. So we've got a very extensive process. McElroy is uh, coming up on our seventieth anniversary, and um, running running. Uh, very strong in that world today. I got to say, Jim, it was a great move when you took inspector training full online. Uh, I've taken that class now, and uh, I got to say hats off to you guys on that. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, all right, before I turn it over to Jim, uh, I want to bring on Alan Ambler, who we haven't introduced yet, and have Alan uh, give us a couple of slides on the background of, of polyethylene. Alan's a regular here in the webinar program, uh, and we'll be hosting um, the next two webinars coming up in February uh, that are on um, uh, how you integrate polyethylene into the modern water system, and also the old standby HDPE 301. Um, Alan Ambler. Hey there, everybody. Uh, I'm so happy that... Um... Peter and Dan came and brought cold weather fusion. Uh, of course, I am from Florida, so that's not going to work for me to be able to do this. And I'm so pleased that Jim Johnston, Rick Ponder, uh, and Chris Waits, as well as Tarek Spear, a little bit later on, will tell you exactly what it really means to be cold. But until we get to that time, we'll start back at the basics. I always love the opportunity to do so. And we'll start with what is polyethylene? So polyethylene is something that we talk about quite a bit, obviously, <clears throat> nonprofit uh, promoting uh, polyethylene's adoption, municipal 
water and wastewater systems. It's a semi-crystalline polymer that's also a thermoplastic. So with a thermoplastic, uh, that means that that can be repeatedly heated and cooled and heated and cooled. And that joint that is created from um, that thermoplastic or that melting process is as strong, if not stronger, than the actual pipe material itself. And so de definitely don't hesitate to use that Q&A function and type questions. Richard's chomping at the bit to be able to answer your questions there. Uh, and we really love those uh, live as we're con continuing through these presentations. So advance to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> what we'll see in polyethylene uh, as this continues to go, it's kind of like chocolate. So as we continue to, to show you what happens, we are going to reform, um, melt that surface, in butt fusion, we'll push it up against and control uh, the pressures to which we are um, uh, putting those two surfaces together in that interface and allowing the molecules to run across that connection. Uh, and what we're doing in that scenario is, is allowing that uh, integration of that polyethylene molecule to be able to run through that connection and continue to uh, form that bond that we're looking for. That joint is exactly what we're looking uh, for and wanting for it to be as strong, if not stronger than the pipe material itself. Next slide. So what happens during this, if we'll just fast forward through the entire animation here, we're going to see those two surfaces at rest. Uh, and then when we start to heat that surface up, um, all of those chains will, will uh, disentangle in that manner and then start to move across that surface. Uh, and all this is, is hydrogen and carbons uh, as we're moving through in polyethylene. And then it gets between that boundary as we continue to um, move across. And then as it cools, then that uh, will be as strong, if not stronger than the pipe itself. So, Jim, um, take it away. All right. Thanks, Alan. That's a, a, a great overview of, of, of what we have there and, and, and how this works. And uh, so let's let's talk about that strength of fusion. As Alan, as Alan said there, um, the fusion process itself is that melting of the joint and bringing together. And in this case, we're showing the butt fusion process itself coming together and that molten zone bringing the two ends of the pipe together and then reforming. And now we have a pipe that is as strong as the original pipe itself. And the steps to, to do a butt fusion are, are really fairly simple. You've got to make sure you do it right, but you clean and clamp the pipe. You face the ends to establish that clean parallel surface, align the ends, melt those pipes together, push them together uh, by applying a force, and then hold them through the cooling time, very much uh, to the analogy that Alan showed with the chocolate itself. That same process can happen to a degree uh, also with electrofusion. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rick, if you'll come on and, and talk us through the process of, of electrofusion here, Rick. Can you see me there? I didn't come on? No, just do it without the video. If it doesn't okay. work, we can uh, hear you just fine. Okay, obviously. With with the electrofusion, it's going to require an electrofusion fitting. Uh, and while it's a it's a very robust fusion process, just as uh, butt fusion is, it just utilizes a different methodology of getting there. So we have to have the fitting. We have to have clean, peeled surfaces so we can get down to virgin material. And obviously, the process will be using the fitting to uh, melt the pipe, melt the fitting. It's going to swell. It's going to create the contact between the interfacial area between the pipe surface and the fitting. It's going to move between the uh, the cold zones, and then that's where the co-mingling of the process of the uh, actual molecules are going to take place. And then it cools down, and you have a very robust fusion joint. Uh, we talked about doing the actual fusion. It's, uh, the methodology is with the electrofusion fitting. It has a uh, two areas. We have a fusion zone, the area where we have the wires, and the area where we don't have the wires, which are the cold zones. And as the these uh, fusion zones heat up and it begins to expand and move out to the cold zone, it dams up, builds the interfacial pressure, and then the actual fusion takes place, basically in the simplest form there. It's gonna utilize a uh, electrofusion processor. We also call that a uh, control box. Um, on all the electrofusion fittings, we have barcodes that allows us to be kind of a, 
a universal way of inputting the fusion data uh, by scanning the barcode. The processor will recognize uh, the fusion parameters that each fitting has, and it'll put it into the process and into the processor after you attach the leads and, and scan the barcode. It, and we just want to make sure that when you're going through this process, that the data that you have on the label is being confirmed with what you have on the screen. And then after you, you hit the uh, start button, things are good to go. And that's anything else there. That's it, Rick. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. All right. With that, we're going to talk about, uh, as the title of the, of the, presentation today is cold weather fusion, but we're going to talk about inclement weather. And while our focus today is going to be on inclement, or is going to be really very heavily focused on cold weather, this really applies to any kind of inclement weather that, that you may run into, uh, situations where there could be contamination, water, uh, other ingress into the fusion area, whether it's, whether it's electrofusion, butt fusion, it doesn't really matter what your process is. You shouldn't be uh, doing any kind of pipe fitting uh, of any kind in, in without some sort of protection. So we're going to talk about that in terms of that general generic uh, weather condition that's unsafe or undesirable. It can come from rain, snow, sleet, hail, high winds, extreme temperatures. We'll talk about uh, situations in Australia this past year where we saw temperatures uh, approaching 130 degrees, 130 degrees plus out in the out in the outback. So take take those into account as we move forward. With that, we always talk about safety. And Chris, you've been on you've been on job sites. You want to talk a little bit about how safety impacts any job site that we're talking about. Well, okay. There, there's Chris. Sorry about that. Uh, forgot to unmute my, my mic there. So obviously safety is going to be your number one priority on any job site. Um, polyethylene, when you're out there fusing, it doesn't have any other unique safety considerations comparative to any other pipe. Uh, the big thing I will tell you is in the cold and, uh, you know, dragging and, and stuff like that on these job sites that you see, you will see a lot of kinetic energy built up in this pipe. The colder it is, the stiffer it gets, and you will get into a, a, a safety aspect of that. Other than that, I mean, it's really, your, your safety is gonna be your priority number one, but at the end of it all, you're going to be uh, no different than any other type of pipe. Did, did my slides go haywire here? Yes, sir. All right. Sorry, I have had a little bit of a failure. Hold a moment, please. So, Chris, you were saying that that safety really doesn't matter what kind of job site you're on, right? That it, it is it is whatever whatever system you're doing, wherever you are, you should be you should be following your safety protocols and. And handling Absolutely. that that's even more important with cold weather yes sir the the pipe is going to be very uh it, it's going to be a lot stiffer in cold weather it's going to not take the impact resistance um when you're roping and roping pipe around the corner and stuff like that in the winter time that pipe is going to carry a lot more kinetic energy throughout it because it is stiffer um it's not closer to a, a molten material at that point chris what are what are the three top ways a guy's going to get hurt on a job site with a polyethylene uh, pipe present? Loading and unloading is probably going to be the number one um, situation out there. See more people when you're loading and unloading pipe, you got to be sure that first off, you're over the length of the pipe away from the end of it while you're loading and unloading it. Second off, you're not on the backside of a truck. I've seen more people in the field uh, drivers that aren't experienced when they're hauling this, they'll walk around the backside of the truck and you will see a forklift come in. They will uh, go to grab a bundle of pipe and off the backside goes a, a sticker to a pipe or even a whole bundle of pipe. That's one of the biggest safety concerns out there. And then when you're dragging this pipe, 
remember that it has that stored kinetic energy in it. So when it comes around the corner, that tail, especially at the end, that tail is going to whip out. Them are the two safe primary safety concerns I see in the field. Are there any concerns with fusion operations? Yes, uh, various pinch points. You don't want to put your uh, put your fingers in anywhere without making sure the machine is either disabled or controls are locked out. Uh, Macro has done a very good job, especially on their larger diameter fusion equipment, to where you can shut that machine down where there's no hydraulic movement while you reach in to clean out shavings. You don't bump a control or anything to that effect. Good. Thank you. Are you seeing my slides back? Yeah, you're good. Okay. All right. Sorry for everybody. Uh, as we all know, technology, some days, some days is our friend and some days it's a challenge. Um, so as we talk about this, one of the things that's, that's really key with polyethylene is that uh, one, of the, one of the great pieces of polyethylene and, and the advantages is that it can freeze solid without damage. So you've got a huge advantage here versus um, other entrenched materials that are out there that will just shatter uh, as, as the pipe expands. That, that polyethylene pipe has enough flexibility in it that can freeze solid. Uh, on the inside. So that's a great behavioral characteristics and, and, and one of the great advantages, especially in a cold weather situation, uh, even when you've got situations where this, this pipe is not uh, buried below the freeze line, you've got, you've got uh, the capability that it can survive that situation. Um, and it can, it can happen, it can do that without damage at all. We've also got some really good slides up here. Uh, this pipe that you're seeing on the line is actually insulated pipe. So there is a carrier pipe in the middle where you see the water flowing out. And around that is an insulation layer and another layer of polyethylene over the top of that. So you can actually have insulated pipe that, that further uh, keeps that water flowing, not just freezing and allowing it to be able to, to manage that freeze, but continuing to move. Here's some other situations where you see uh, see some some of that uh, insulated pipe, and when we go to join that pipe, whether it's by butt fusion or electrofusion, that insulation area is stripped back from the end of the carrier pipe, and either your electrofusion or butt fusion are done there, and then typically a wrap. Um, many times a wrap will come back over uh, that 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 uh, exposed area and, and re-insulate that component. But now you have a completely insulated system throughout your process. One of the other features that uh, you'll always see is use the tools that are available to you to help align the pipe. Uh, the beauty of, of polyethylene pipe systems is whether you're using coil pipe or stick pipe, you can have very, very long runs of pipe and that capability. And you want to use that, uh, use pipe stands, lifts, rollers, other components to keep that material off of the ground so it doesn't get scratched, uh, but also to help you move the pipe into the machine, move the pipe out of the machine, uh, minimize that, that, that friction piece. And Chris, I, I'm sure you've got some comments relative to, to the equipment that we, that's available out there and why it's important. Yes, sir. Uh, so the biggest key in this whole situation um, and these productivity tools that Macroy offers is setting your job site up correctly. If you set that job site up correctly and you use the tools properly, the way they're intended to be used, you will, not only is it going to increase your production, even in cold or uh, extremely hot weather, but it's going to make your job site much safer. When you're out there with equipment, you're just trying to hold up on the pipe and fuse it and, and drag it and not use the tools properly. It makes your job site much less productive and it also uh, makes it much more unsafe than it would be if you just set it up, take the time to set it up and do it properly. Yeah, thank you. So um, got a couple of examples of some, some installations that are really key or really, really great examples of both cold weather applications and cold weather ultimate uses, uh, the West Fork Upper Battle Creek, Creek Diversion. Uh, this was really a, a fantastic project in the state of Alaska. Uh, it was put in at the Bradley Lake Hydroelectric Dam, which covers a huge portion 
of, uh, of southern Alaska, uh, that hydroelectric dam. And the reservoir that feeds that hydroelectric dam was running low. And there is a glacier stream that was rerouted uh, to be able to continue that glacier stream on its current path, but at certain times to be able to be diverted to refill the reservoir. So it was two and a half miles of 63 inch DR-17. For those of you that are not familiar with that, DR-17 now it's uh, roughly three and a half, 3.7 inch wall thickness material. This was built up literally the side of a mountain going up a great glacier. You can see the McElroy Talon going up that grade. They were fusing on that side of that hill up to an 18% grade. Uh, this was one of the toughest projects that was out there. Uh, this, this machine has ever seen. This machine will do up to two meter diameter. This pipeline was bare, the, the road was built and then it was buried right into the side of the road. And then the road was taken back out at the end of this project because it's on a national park. Uh, so uh, very cold situation, obviously, in, in, in Alaska, uh, but a great application for polyethylene can be a long-term solution to maintain that hydroelectric dam up in that area. And uh, really a fantastic solution for hydraulic for uh, HDPE. Uh, I was on this job site. You can actually see uh, the grizzly bear in that bottom left picture, not a grizzly bear, but a black bear, uh, coming and inspecting the pipeline. They had to chase bears off the job site quite a few times. And in the bottom right picture, you can, you can see that, that uh, amount of incline that goes up the hill and the tie in here at the bottom uh, as they're doing sections as they go up this hill. So Rick, if you would come back on and talk about, let's talk a little bit about normal operating temperatures. Where to, where, how do you, how do you process and how do you, how do you do things? What's normal? So when we talk about normal operating temperatures, basically what we're talking about is the operating, the ambient operating temperatures when you're installing electrofusion fittings, where you don't have to make any changes to the standard fusion times or procedures. And electrofusion that tends to range between 14 degrees and 114 degrees. Now, it can be fused colder, it can be fused hotter, but in those instances, we basically would like uh, to be called to find out what temperature range, just in the event we may need to modify fusion times or something like that. Okay. Yeah, and on the, on the butt fusion side, uh, the standard basically says you should not be fusing below five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there's a lot of a lot of things that are go there, and we're going to talk a little bit uh, as we get further into this. You're going to hear me say uh, a few times, Chris, come on as well. Um, yes, yeah, sir. We talk. Go ahead. So to touch base on on that statement that you just made, it doesn't mean that you can't fuse below five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's not recommended to fuse below five degrees Fahrenheit without precautionary measures being taken. So. It doesn't mean all of us up north have to shut our jobs down when it gets cold outside. So keep that in mind when when Jim's talking about cold weather fusion. Yeah, and, and exactly because we we uh, I know of a job in northern Japan that was doing fusions where the outside temperature was minus forty seven. So um, it's not about the outside temperature, and we're going to talk more about this as we go through the day today. Is it's about changing the environment if it's when the outside temperature is below that point, you need to change the environment. Uh, you don't change your procedures, whether it's electrofusion or butt fusion, but change the environment, put it into a container, do some other components. So we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit more. Alan, if you're gonna come on, talk a little bit about where we are with, with uh, temperatures and operating ranges. Microphone. All right, so All looks right. like we're having an issue with okay. uh, Alan. So Go ahead, the, the material itself, uh, polyethylene itself, has a service temperature range ranging from minus 40 degrees, to, uh, which is roughly minus 40 degrees Celsius, roughly, uh, also to 140 degrees. That's your operating temperature um, for the material in in process you're going to have some applications where you're going to be hotter than that but you're going to lower the pressure 
the glass transition temperature, meaning when is this material going to fracture if I hit it, uh, is minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Hopefully none of us ever have to see minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. But that means it's much more flexible. It has much more capability. Um, if we were to look at some of the other amorphous polymers, which are not HDPE, some of the other plastics that are out there, their brittle temperature, that glass transition, meaning where they become brittle, brittle to impact, happens at 220 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're brittle just sitting on the ground. Um, so again, and one of the other great uh, uh, advantages of using HDPE. Um, thermal effects themselves, we actually see that, that uh, polyethylene has a very strong thermal expansion rate. Uh, the rule of thumb is a very easy piece to use here, which is 1, 10, 100, meaning that it will con contract or expand at a rate of one inch per 10 degrees Fahrenheit per 100 feet of section. Now, that's unconstrained. It means if it's just laying on the ground, it will expand or contract at that 1, 10, 100 uh, piece but it takes a very much smaller force to restrain that because the force of that expansion is much less than carbon steel or stainless. If you look yeah, at- Hit the animation on that. It'll show it at the bottom. Oh, there it there is, okay. Sorry. Um, so a, a two inch schedule 40 pipe in its contraction will actually have almost 8,000 pounds of, of force uh, in its contraction. However, that that longer expansion uh, in a two inch HDPE pipe will be 321 pounds because the elastic the elastic modulus is so much smaller than those other materials. So your restraint requirements on those larger pieces is so much greater. There's Alan. Do you want to add in here, Alan? Oh yes. Um, uh, sorry for that. Um, one of the key things when we're when we're looking at HDP in a cold environment, um, if you want to go to the video on the next um, slide, it'll kind of bring a synopsis to it all here. Um, as that pipe just gets colder, then it just requires more force to be able to maneuver, manipulate it, move it, and things of that nature. So <clears throat> um, you you still have all of the behaviors that are inherent with HDPE with durability, flexibility, and all those things. We just now need to be able to manage that pipe in the cold environment with uh, additional force. That, that's it in a nutshell. So guys, if, if I could summarize handling polyethylene in a cold environment, I would say when it's colder, it's more pressure capable, but it's also stiffer and it's harder to handle. W would you agree? It, it is harder to handle than it's, well, I wouldn't say it's harder to handle. It is, it is take, know what you're dealing with and take your time. So coiled pipe, um, you just need to go slower than you would if it were 80 degrees outside. Um, okay. Chris, how advantage. would you characterize it? I would characterize it a little like Jim there, but uh, coil pipe is is huge, and that's where you see most of your injuries come in in the polyethylene market. Um, I've seen guys that this this prime video that you guys just played on this this presentation, that guy walking along that that uh, spool out trailer is is not the smartest place to be. You would want to be in front of that in front of that trailer because if that pipe were to by chance break that tail is coming around. That pipe has that memory and it wants to come around and re, you know, recoil itself back up. So it's that, that's just like a clock it. spring. It's just like yes, a sir. clock spring. It's going to roll right back up. Thanks, fellas. Okay. Rick, do you want to come on and talk a little yes. bit about where we are with getting sure. to equilibrium? Yeah, I mean, since we know that uh, temperature does have an effect on uh, the polyethylene pipe and fittings dimensions, um, and we also know that electrofusion fittings are manufactured to really tight ASTM, ASTM dimensional requirements, 
we really have to make sure that both the pipe and the fitting are acclimated to the same temperature. In other words, if, they're, if both the pipe and the fitting are the same temperature, everything's gonna go together fine. The interfacial gap's gonna be, is not gonna be too large that uh, it can't be filled as the plastic melts and expands. When you have a pipe that's at a higher temperature and a fitting that's a lower temperature, the pipe could be larger than the fitting and it may not go into the fitting easily or at all. Uh, if the pipe is colder, than the uh, actual fitting, then it's gonna be smaller, then it will slip in easily, yeah, but uh, the gap may be too large for the, the fitting to actually heat up and expand and close the interfacial gap like you need to do to get a good fusion. Great, Rick, thank you. So, so there are considerations to, to, to come into this. And again, these are a little bit like the safety considerations when you're dealing with cold weather uh, world, what, whatever pipe system you're dealing with, you're gonna have these kinds of things. And so these are just the specifics that we need to know. Uh, relative to the equipment on the butt fusion side, you've got hydraulics that are involved here and cold weather temperatures and hydraulics. Um, you need to make sure that you're choosing the appropriate hydraulic fluid uh, for, for the application that you've got. If you're in a very, very cold situation and you're using a high temperature hydraulic fluid it can it can get really it can get really maple syrupy and uh, that changes your characteristics and, and affects your pump it does a lot of other things so you want to make sure that your equipment is set up to to maintain that and as you look at the chart this comes from in fact our uh, McElroy recommended uh, hydraulic fluid there's a pretty broad range uh, of operating temperatures for hyd hydraulic uh, fluids, but if you are working above the Arctic Circle, you're going to have some specifics where you want to be really close with that. Chris, I think you even have some situations sometime in Wyoming where it uh, it can get pretty darn cold up there. Absolutely, and making sure that you have the uh, the proper uh, hydraulic fluid in your in your equipment based off of your temperature is huge. I've had machines come up that we've shipped them. Obviously, we have locations all over the United States. But you ship them up from down south, and they've got uh, that uh, molasses type hydraulic oil in there. And you fire it up up here, and it starts blowing oil coolers out or blowing hoses because it'll back pressure that system because it's like pumping honey. So be sure that you're really selecting the right oil and checking all of that before you uh, before you and, fire that machine up and, and it, tear things up. Yeah, so and that's the same for the generators as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Chris, you know, while, while Jim goes to the next slide, what, how long does it take if I've got a, a McElroy fusion machine out in the cold and I bring it inside a tent, how long does it take that hydraulic fluid to warm up so I can safely operate that McElroy machine? So it's really going to be based off, obviously, in the temperature, what your conditions are inside the, uh, inside the tent. But you got to think about all this. Their hydraulic tanks are all iron. It, that you can walk up to that and you can put a heater on that iron tank and the surface of the iron is going to feel warm. It's no different than boiling water. You touch the pan, the pan's going to be hot, but the, the material inside the pan, it takes longer for that to heat up. So you really, it's in, in all macro effusion equipment, generally speaking, they have a, a temperature gauge on that hydraulic tank. So make sure that that's in the operating range temperature wise before you fire the machine up. Right. So generators, uh, same situations. You've got cold weather, altitudes. You've got other components. You want to make sure that they have the right hydraulic fluid in them. But, but uh, they're also going to be affected. The output voltage is going to be affected uh, by that temperature and their ability to run. Um, so we got to be careful with that. Whether it's electrofusion or operating a an electric only fusion machine or butt fusion machine, correct? Yeah, so the other situation is, is remember temperature derates your generator. It's not going to perform at its peak. Um, I see a lot of guys that will ultimately, um, and gals out there, that they go look at a generator and it says it's 7,500 watts. Well, I looked at my, my situation there. Of, that's what it says my power requirement is, but they're not reading the fine print on that generator of elevation changes and how it derates, and that's peak wattage when it fires up. So we want to be sure that we're taking care of that. Uh, Macro has been really good at putting out the wattage requirements 
of what's going on on all their heaters and all their fusion equipment. So be sure you're protecting everything. The heater, always, if you can, go to the next size up generator to make sure that you're, you're overrated rather than underrated. And all the electric fusion uh, manufacturers do that, Rick. I know that you guys have uh, very specific requirements and, and specify what the minimum requirements are for, for firing firing all those pieces as well. Yeah, we, we, we do. All right, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna take the next couple of slides here, fellas. Um, we've got, for our audience, we've got half an hour left and we've got some of the best content to come. We're very thankful for ASTM and the Plastics Pipe Institute for giving us a lot of guidance. Uh, in fact, uh, PPI uh, produced last year um, a cold weather a uh, technical note or an MAB document, it's MAB number 08. And uh, the Municipal Advisory Board is a subset of the Plastics Pipe Institute, specifically their Municipal and Industrial Division managed by uh, the preeminent Camille Rubias who does a fantastic job. And anyway, so we got the idea for doing this deck uh, because of this great document that they produced. And they set out about 10 different things that are good to know. Uh, like really basic stuff. Hey, if you're going to do a fusion, remove the snow and ice uh, from the fusion zone. Uh, don't drop the pipe. Duh. But you know what? The reason I say it's a little bit harder to, to manage is because it's cold. You've got gloves on. Your machinery doesn't operate as uh, well as, it, as you may expect it to. Um, use enclosures. You know, we talk about, yeah, let's fuse at zero degrees. But guess what? Every experienced individual that's doing fusion operations below 32 either has a tent or wishes they had one. Um, so in fact, the MAB came out and I think Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, they said, we don't really want you fusing under 32, 32F Correct. or zero C unless you have taken the necessary precautions that we will spend time on. Uh, also other key elements are uh, shield the fusion area with uh, a shelter or a tent make sure that the ID and the OD have no moisture. A lot of people that like to hate on us say, oh, you've got to have a dry fusion zone. We can just put our pipe together when it's cold and wet. You're right. But do you want a joint that's going to last hundreds of years? Then go with polyethylene. Um, then there's this whole thing that I can't wait to hear Chris and Jim talk about of preheating the pipe, whether you use forced air or you use heating blankets. I've seen that a couple of times in the field, but those guys know a whole lot more about it than I do. But we've established as with this team, some golden rules. The first golden rule is be patient, accept the fact that it's cold, accept the fact that the weather isn't any good and that you have decided to do fusion even though it's raining or cold or foggy or it's sleeting. This is the one I love. When I was taking my fusion classes from Jim and his colleagues at McElroy down in Tulsa, they said to me, change the conditions, not the procedure. Jim, tell us about that. So it's really the, the, the standard procedure that's out there is ASTM F2620. It prescribes all the components and all of the, the functions that you do, heat times, pressures, all of those pieces. And those don't change with the temperature. So what you want to do is make sure that you change your conditions so that you follow that procedure. So we're not going to change the procedure. We're not going to uh, do anything different. We're not going to crank up heater temperatures. We're going to follow that procedure, but we're going to make sure that all of the materials work in the way that they're supposed to work. Well, Jim, that's why I'm so glad at the beginning that you talked about what the procedures were. Clean it, shave it, heat it, fuse it. And Rick on electrofusion. That are those are the basics. So whether there's snow or wind doesn't matter. We're going to stick to the same procedure. Go ahead, Chris. You're on mute. I see a lot of these guys on the change the conditions, not the procedure. Uh, hundreds of times I've had guys come back. Oh, we crank the heater up to 500 degrees just because it's uh, it, it helps heat it faster when the pipe's cold, and that is. The biggest no-no that you can do out there, that, that changes the properties of the HDP. So people keep that in mind when you're looking across all of this to make sure that you are changing the conditions and not the procedure. It is huge and it will affect your job tremendously. 
and and be patient. I mean, we're not talking about this is changing your time by a hundred percent or even fifty percent. It it just means it is going to slow you down a little bit as you as you heat a cold piece of pipe. Um, but it's assuring that you're doing the things correctly. It's just exactly. ensuring that joint going forward. It's not. It is not a significant amount of time, and those shortcuts are detrimental in the long. But run. It, it really, after all my years of experience in the field, Jim. It's going to take you longer to heat that pipe and, and develop your bead, but it's also going to cool down somewhat quicker. There That's is a, exactly a set, right. There's a trade off. Yes, amount of time that you have to let it cool down, but it's also that 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 procedure kind of speeds up in the winter time when the pipe is cold because it is going to cool down faster. It does do that. Yeah. So I see questions are starting to heat up. We love those questions. Keep them coming. Uh, and the next slide, Jim. <laughs> I, I'd like to ask you guys. And I, I don't recall ever seeing this in a procedure. How far back do I have to clean off the moisture in the snow from the point at which I'm doing facing operations? Uh, my short answer would be <clears throat> is you want to clean back past the, or at least equivalent to the first jaw. Uh, but you want to be at, at several inches away from the from the uh, face-off zone so that you don't, if there's if there's moisture inside the pipe or on top of the pipe, that it doesn't follow or leak down the pipe and come back into the into the situation. Good practice is to, is to clean the whole section that's going in the machine. Yeah. Chris, you anything want to add anything? That comes in anything that comes in contact with the machine, uh, you want to clean that snow and ice and dirt off of it. Uh, not only is that going to keep your serrations clean and it's going to grip your pipe better, especially as this pipe's contracting in the cold, them jaws have to close down just a little bit more to uh, to hold it in there. So anything that's going to be in contact with the machine, I recommend cleaning off and having a nice clean surface. All right. So you're going past, Chris, you're going past the second jaw. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going all yeah. the way outside the fusion machine. That so way you're not getting, these any, maybe four you're not getting anything. Maybe yeah. You're not getting any contamination on the machine that gets pulled in with the next joint. So this next slide, I mean, I love this one. Uh, inspect the pipe for damage. Uh, okay, good. Inspect it. Cut out any compromised areas. The cool thing is with that that jagged edge there, you can cut that out. If it's greater than 10% of the pipe wall, you cut it out, face, fuse. This next image I got from Richard Colossa. Um, that guy, he ended up getting a drunk driving ticket. Uh, you see his tire there on the polyethylene pipe. And in fact, that polyethylene pipe was not damaged. Um, but you had to inspect it to make sure that it was not. So we also say, hey, don't drop the pipe, particularly when it's cold. You want to place your polyethylene pipe. Uh, so we can't say for certain that the pipe isn't going to get damaged if you drop it from a height and it's super cold. In fact, uh, Richard Klasa tells a story about a horizontal directional drill he did that some car hit his pipe, they pulled it in, and of course, they found a crack right at the apex of the drill at the bottom. Uh, and it was 40 degrees out, uh, 40 degrees below zero when that car impacted that pipe. So you can damage the polyethylene pipe. So we do like to talk about protecting that fusion zone. What a great way to do it is use a structure, a 20 foot or a 40 foot trailer, uh, or buy a tent and get sides on it. But don't use excessive heat, whether it's a blanket or whether it's forced air, and we have a guideline for how much heat you can use. Uh, I love this next one because uh, it's, we talk about shielding the fusion zone, but here we have uh, a two great, you know, Chris Waite talks about productivity tools. Well, here are two great ones. One, we have uh, the Quick Camp, which is McElroy's version of a tent. And the second is, Jim, what's the specific brand name of the product there on the previous slide? on the right that that holds the is that the poly horse that holds that polyethylene pipe yeah that is the, that is the poly horse that big rack that feeds into the into the quick camps called the poly horse yes so that's like one guy once he gets it loaded one guy can do all that absolutely yeah so there is powered rollers on the front edge of that so an entire bundle of pipe can be stacked and set and then you've just got a, a system that feeds directly into the machine uh, using a powered roller. So one person can do that. You can eliminate a lot of material handling and, and other things on that job site by just moving, move, bringing in those full bundles and, and stringing that pipe out. Yeah, cool. fantastic solution. 
And we have just a couple other images here. A lot of guys will use their own tents. They'll make up their own deal and their own version of uh, the side protection. Don't forget, you have to have exhaust for that McElroy machine. Um, so it's a fantastic way to control your environment. Don't change the procedure, change the conditions. Now we're up to Alberta. Who wants to handle telling this Alberta story? Jim, why don't you take it? Yeah, I can take it. So this was a uh, wastewater system up in Alberta, Canada. Uh, it was 10 kilometers long, um, supporting a wastewater system for a very large uh, uh, population growth up in that area. It was horizontal directional drill and, and open cut. Uh, NIB development was the, was the primary contractor on that. They had previously tried to use just tents, but they found that in their conditions, they were having they were having troubles with just tents. And they ended up buying a quick camp system with poly horse, that big rack uh, system that you see there and uh, taking them the ability to 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 set and, and load all of this piping into their system very quickly and easily. And uh, it's the inside of this container is temperature controlled. So the operator was able to do this in a temperature controlled environment controlled, not only the fusion process, but you're also protecting the operator. Remember, if your operator is not, not able to perform at minus 40 degrees. So even above and beyond what we're talking about with the equipment, you want to protect your operator. Uh, in this case, this, this uh, container opens up, actually has space for office or storage even. And, uh, and really drove home a, a, a really great opportunity for them. And they finished that job well ahead of their, of their other schedule because they were able to protect the operation, protect the operator, and actually run 24 hours a day through that process. So the other thing we want to talk about as a, and this is in general terms, plug the ends of your pipe. Um, that this is an opportunity to one, keep the interior of your pipe clean um, and, and clear, but it also prevents wind from flowing down the end of that pipe. You have a giant Venturi tube. Uh, if you have an open end there that's blowing cold air or dust or other contaminants into your fusion zone. So if you cap the end of your pipe, uh, we've seen everything from the caps that you see here uh, in this, in this location up to just simple trash bags and other other pieces, but just cap the ends of that pipe and it'll help you with your cleanliness, help you with your your uh, your overall flow of material. Well, keep in mind on that, Jim, um, when they're capping the end of the pipe, you want to cap that pipe when it gets to the job site. Yes. Don't wait until right the day you're going to fuse it because at that point you're already full of ice and snow and uh, yep. critters that are hiding critters. through from the cold elements and stuff like that. Yep. So as that pipe's showing up, stick your bag over the end or whatever you're gonna use. Do that when the pipe shows up on location because when it comes from the factory, it's as clean as it's gonna get inside. Yep, and the last thing you want to happen is have a skunk uh, squirt in the middle of your pipe during the middle of a fusion. <laughs> that, that'll ruin your day. Hey Jim, just a comment on that. Sorry, I'm not supposed to be involved here, but yep. uh, for that, you can, request uh if it's a isolated um uh job site and it's way out in the boonies or whatever we can cap that pipe for you uh there is an additional little cost associated with that but um it's 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 marginal it's not that much but it's it you can request that and we can from the cap it for you and you're saying yeah from the manufacturing standpoint the manufacturer. but we need to know that prior to the order we won't do it after the fact because it's just not efficient it's much more efficient to cap in line uh, after the pipe has been tested and it's a lot easier for us that way. So great, Richard. Thank you for, thank you for that. Um, so we talked about one of the pieces that, uh, one of the steps that we're, that are, that are ongoing here is ensure that equipment is free of ice and snow. Uh, this is also that dirt aspect. So when we talk about inclement weather, don't let, don't let snow, ice, moisture, water, dirt get on your on your machine clean it up as much as you can because when i when i finish this fusion and pull that pipe through i'm dragging uh snow and ice all the way through there ensure that the id and the od of the pipe are clear of moisture that's not just visible snow but but moisture so you don't want that water getting into the joint either in the id or the od 
It's a simple process. Just clean it off before you put it into the machine and make sure that you've got good, clean capabilities. So use portable heaters, and there are a ton of choices out there. And Chris, I, you might talk about some of them that you've seen out in the field. We want to make sure that you're using uh, either indirect heat. If you're using a flamed heater, you don't want to put flame on polyethylene. Uh, but salamanders are one of those big ones that we that, that we see used quite a bit and can use uh, indirect heat off of that through a through a, a venting system or a tube um, to, to run over into the pipe or onto the pipe or into the tent um, to maintain that temperature and raise the temperature inside the heating zone. Yeah, so the biggest ones that I see out there, uh, I mean, you get into infrared heaters. The salamanders are great. They make flameless rig heaters. Um, the, the flameless rig heaters are probably about the best because they put off the most heat. You can heat it up quicker. Um, with, with tinting the end of the of the bundles of pipe, you can get that stuff up to temperature uh, in a nice fusion range uh, a lot quicker. So some of the some of the heating blankets and stuff like that, they're going to take a lot of time because once you wrap it on there, then the thermostat kicks in and stuff like that. They're great for electrofusion. Um, I don't necessarily recommend them for butt fusion when you're out there because they are they are time suckers at that point. Um, so one of the options as we get into this is to preheat that pipe. So um, as Rick talked about for the electrofusion, where you want to have stability of pipe, you want to make sure that you're you, <laughs> if you're going to be bringing this pipe up against a, a heater uh, that's 450 degrees, <clears throat> but you don't want a huge shock uh, uh, to that to that heater because you're still trying to melt the ends of that pipe. So it helps to preheat that pipe. Uh, Try to do that in an insulated area. We see a lot of pipe being maintained in a, in a tent by itself. You don't want to heat it to greater than 120 degrees <clears throat> um, just because that's you're starting to get into zones where you don't want to mess with the sag of the, of the pipe or any other components. And use multiple heaters where you can. Um, Reels and stick pipes can be tinted with tarps and heated with uh, warm air from an indirect fired heater, as Chris was talking about. You can you can have that prepped and ready. Uh, it helps your it helps your pipe be cleaner before it goes into the machine. So there's a lot of things you can have on site ready to go and be ready to go into that into that tent with a piece of pipe that's ready to be fused. So Jim, thirty percent of the folks on the call today consider themselves advanced. Uh, where does heating and preheating and cold weather operations play with the whole uh, McElroy accelerated um, cooling, optimized cooling? So optimized cooling, um, so heating and preheating, optimized cooling only applies to the cooling side of this. So it does not affect the, the heating side. So um, heating and, and uh, preheating uh, are one of those things where it's still be patient follow the procedure, take advantage uh, of, of those pieces. So there's no change uh, by using optimized cooling in the heating or preheating stage of this because you're okay, still so going to have- so The software on the DL7 permits us to use optimized cooling even though we're fusing in a tent and things are cold. Even though we're, even though we're fusing, we are taking into account the ambient temperature and the, and the temperature of the pipe for, to calculate the cooling time. Uh, but the heat time, the bead size, all of those components that are part of the procedure do not change. Great. Thank you. Again. So that same thing, just to touch base on that a little bit, it's going to ask you on the data logger uh, for the optimized cooling what your pipe temperature is. Now, if you're preheating that pipe all the way up to the maximum of 120 degrees, that is going to affect your cool down time on optimized cooling. So keep that in mind. You want to get that pipe up hot enough where it's, it, it will still fuse properly, but you don't want to get it so hot uh, that, it, that it's going to increase that time for you if you're trying to run optimized cooling. So, so we have a guy uh, just asked a great question. Yeah. He goes, okay, Cole, what about hot? He's seen pipe as hot as 200 F. We're not supposed to preheat above 120. So what is he supposed to do when the pipe already starts super hot? 
So when it starts super hot, one in those cases, you're wanting you want to have some protection there. Black pipe is going to be a black body that absorbs heat. Uh, your best your best choice is to try and try and uh, protect that with a tarp or other things. But it is it is not one of those where you can't preheat. You don't. It's not a prohibition to have the pipe greater than 120 degrees. It's just a a best practice to not try and go any hotter than that in the cold weather situation. Um, and we do see, we've seen 160, uh, 170 uh, in heat in sun loaded pipe. I've never seen 200. That's pretty, um, that's, that's pretty extreme. And that is going to extend your cool time uh, quite a bit because you're up into a very uh, almost not at a softening point, but you're getting close to uh, uh, to a point where from your cooling standpoint and your ability to handle that pipe, you're going to have to slow down and really allow that pipe to cool for a long time or protect that joint to allow it to cool for a long time. Great. Good explanation, guys. We're just got a couple slides left in the main deck. And yep. then because I know we're at the top of the hour and we typically lose a, fo a few folks at the top of the hour, we're going to bring Tariq on to talk about his experience in Alaska in about five minutes. So from a standpoint of managing your time, there we go, take it away, Jim. Okay, so uh, last couple of slides here as we, as we bang through, keep your heater in its insulated bag so that, it's, so that it is maintaining itself. You know, it's just like your operator. If you're out there running this machine, you wanna stay in your jacket so you don't get cold, keep your, keep your heater in its jacket so it doesn't get cold. Um, Summary overall, don't drop the pipe. Provide adequate enclosures. This is good for you, it's good for the operator, it's good for the process. We wanna make sure that we have the capabilities to protect that fusion process, electrofusion or butt fusion. Make sure that it's clean, it's dry, it's, it's uh, protecting the operator. Use tents and warm air wherever possible. Um, protect the fusion zone. Use space heaters where you can, preheat the pipe where you can, keep the heating tool in an insulated container. Understand your thermal effects. Uh, that could be cold, that could be hot, just like we just talked about. There's going to have, you're going to have pieces there. So just know your, your extremes. And when we're talking about these, we are talking about extremes on these sides. Um, provide the enclosures, protect the fusion zone, keep it in the, in the heating container in windy situations. Cap the pipes, protect the fusion zone, provide closures, keep the heater in an insulated container. These are all pretty, pretty rote over and over pieces. Um, in precipitation, whether that's rain, snow, sleet, hail, hopefully you're in a container, you're in a protected area if it's hailing, um, remove and clean that ice and melted pipe from the, or snow from the pipe, make sure it's clean and free of moisture, provide enclosures, protect the fusion zone, clear the ID and the OD, and keep the heating tool in its insulated container. And with that, uh, we will have, uh, this is our contact information. I want to thank again, Rick and, and Chris and, and Peter and, and uh, Alan and uh, Richard for, for joining in here and, and being ahead of us and, and everybody else that was involved today uh dan thank you for kicking us off and peter thanks for having us on on yeah, today to, you bet jim to great this. job great job um all right uh chris i'd like to af have you introduce a question then we'll go to alan to introduce Tariq, and we'll finish it up by you know 18 20 minutes after the hour chris take it away what's that question yeah so there was a great question on on the question and answer about the increase of heat soak time during extreme cold weather fusion or fusion uh, McRoy is saying in several scenarios that it could cause brittle fracture during destructive testing. So ultimately on that situation, if you're preheating your pipe properly, you shouldn't get to that situation where you're having a, a extreme case of heat soak time. So it's, it's going to be the key of preheating your pipe before we, uh, before you make the fusion. So your, your heat soak times, yes, they're going to be extended, but they're not going to be that extended that it, uh, that it causes brittle, uh, brittle pipe. Good, good explanation. Thank you, Chris. Alan, you're up. 
All right. Uh, very good, guys. There's a lot of different things to consider for, for cold uh, weather fusion. Um, and I, I have lived in Alaska before myself. One of the things that's always unique to me about Alaska is uh, the conditions that are required to live in Alaska uh, essentially create uh, innovation just to be able to exist there. So many things become second nature and you continue to invent and reinvent. And we met Tarek last summer uh, at a road show in, in Fairbanks and I was just completely and totally taken with how many different things that uh, they actually come up with uh, for invention. Of course, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, and to be able to live in Fairbanks in that, what would you say it was already negative 40 there, Tarek? Uh, at no. some point in time, that's, that's pretty cold. So you're living and breathing it. So without further ado, uh, Tarek's going to share some of their story with us uh, um, of how to actually use water systems in Fairbanks, Alaska. Yeah, thanks, Alan. And boy, I sure wish I was uh, part of this group uh, 12 years ago when we started our journey. Would have saved a lot of, uh, a lot of mistakes. Um, can everyone see my screen? Um, I think we've got your presentation slides in uh, with the, the main presentation. And right now we're looking at Fairbanks sewer and water operations. Uh, oh, would it be okay, okay to- I got you. So anyways, yeah, uh, my name's Tarek Spear. I've been working in uh, water, wastewater, design, uh, development, and construction for 21 years. Fairbanks, uh, we're located 120 miles uh, south of the Arctic Circle. Uh, sunrise uh, this morning was uh, 1038 a.m. and sunset will be 320 p.m. and we uh, have already been experiencing uh, about a week of 3540 below. Operating a water system in uh, the Arctic environment comes with an uh, abundance of uh, challenges. Uh, primarily some of these challenges are uh, large areas of our system. The ground will freeze eight to 12 feet uh, every winter. We call this seasonal freeze. We chart this uh, ground freeze every winter uh, by the month. And as you can see, this gray arc here, this is the roads, parking lots, uh, areas where the snow has been cleared all winter. Uh, the frost uh, drives its deepest. In late March, you can see uh, frost depths of upwards of 12 feet, 8 to 12 feet. This yellow one is uh, your yards, uh, fields, back road, or back uh, uh, behind easements behind properties that typically uh, see, you know, six to eight feet deep. Um, so permafrost, uh, Alaska is, uh, is known for permafrost. Um, it's a uh, ground that's just permanently frozen, very difficult for construction. Uh, I've seen water mains installed in this permafrost and uh, years later, uh, they'll be installed at four and a half, five feet deep and we'll find them at 13 feet deep. They just, uh, as it melts, the mains tend to just settle out of sight. Um, we've discovered directional boring of, uh, Insulated jacketed pipe works real good because you don't disturb that upper layer. Uh, it tends to have a lot of heat built into it and that helps protect the, uh, the pipe from, uh, anyways, it re reduces the speed in which uh, the ground thaws around it. Insulating costs, uh, all of our system, uh, oh, most all our system has some form of insulation on it, depending on pipe size and, uh, thickness of material, this cost ranges from 10 to $25 a foot. I've been doing a lot of uh, experimenting um, and testing on HDP versus ductile and some of the tests, the thermal loss tests, uh, I'm finding I'm using 10 inch HDP, SDR 11 and eight inch ductile, which tend to have about the most similar inside diameter and carrying capacity that uh, our typical construction standard for ductile is two inches of polyurethane foam. And uh, with the HDPE, 
I'm able to get the same or better thermal heat retention with half of the insulation. So anyways, it's uh, pretty exciting for us because insulation is a big cost. It's a big budget item when we're designing our capital and our projects. Um, labor, uh, construction season in Alaska tends to run from March to October. Um, this is probably an October picture. We have our heater set up, uh, you know, like Jim was explaining. This is a eight inch HDPE main. Um, we've had the luxury of a contractor here in Fairbanks that does polyurethane foam. They built a 40 foot lathe. And so they can take this 40 foot HDPE and place it on the lathe and uniformly spray on the exact uh, measurement of insulation we want. So if we want an inch, this pipe would come with an inch of insulation, all dependent on how the water model and thermal loss calculations turn out on a, on a loop and uh, the speed at which it's going to lose its heat. Now, climate, uh, this is probably a November picture. Um, you know, it's hard on people, hard on equipment. Uh, water has to be circulated or glycoled. Um, equipment has to be preheated. Um, this makes for a little longer projects and not to mention uh, daylight uh, hours, like I mentioned. Uh, this is some of this is a SCADA view of one of our um, circ loops, and it kind of shows this the thermal um, heat loss uh, throughout a year. Um, we spend about six hundred forty thousand in steam heat every year from a uh, power plant to keep some of our outer loops at thirty six to thirty eight degrees. You look, take December twenty third, twenty one. You know the ground temperature is still dropping, the water temperatures dropping, even though this main here is circulated at 100 GPM. Uh, it's about 64,000 feet of main. And it kind of flatlines around March or April. And then we have what's called the spring push. And uh, that's around May. Uh, it seems like every year when the uh, surface starts to thaw, that frost runs away from it and goes deeper. And so we'll see a drop in our water temperatures uh, right around May. And then it'll start increasing again June, July, August until it starts dropping again in late September. Um, circulation costs, uh, power consumption, I always envy the gas and power and comp companies. Uh, they seem to be able to run infrastructure out 10 miles or 20 miles wherever they want and just end and start serving. Here in Fairbanks, if I run a new system, an expansion project, uh, 10 miles, I have to turn around and either bring it back or, you know, find other areas, subdivisions to pick up and uh, hopefully amortize out some costs. Um, but then I add a CERC station and I uh, run that CERC station um, November through May. Uh, most CERC loops circulate from 100 GPM to 1500 GPM, depending on the volume of water. Um, corrosion, uh, four out of five of the leaks we have in our system are uh, corrosion holes, typically in, uh, in a pipe called 10 gauge. We have a lot of that. The other one out of five typically is in um, uh, copper service lines. So material handling costs. Uh, this project here was a 36,000 foot water project, expansion project uh, using uh, the uh, four inch SDR 11 insulated jacketed with that uh, jacketing, I think Jim mentioned. We had that whole 36,000 feet show up on four tractor trailers. If that had been ductile, no, we're moving, we're having material come from the manufacturer to a uh, port, barged from the port to Alaska, would have been transported from that port to our insulator, insulated, and then transferred to the job site. This all showed up pre-insulated, jacketed, caps are on the end, um, offloaded and went to work. So Tariq, you, you mentioned um, um, insulated pipe. Do you use heat tracing on your insulation? Um, you know, some, some contracts require heat, uh, heat, you're talking heat tape, right? Uh, right. Yeah. And so, yeah, we've done some force mains where, um, there's a little channel installed and, uh, heat tape will be pulled through, but long-term, you know, and, and, uh, I know I do want to talk to, uh, 
Um, oh, I can't remember his name a little bit more about it, but our experience with heat tape is, you know, it's good for a certain period of time and then um, it quits working. So um, I'm interested in learning more about some of the better um, methods and uh, materials that are out there. I haven't uh, had much time to um, work with them, but most of what we do, um, like all of our water services, we run a half inch PEX to the main and back to the property. And then if the uh, service freezes, we circulate hot water through that and it thaws the service out. So you so, just run that PEX parallel with the polyethylene? Yeah. yeah you know, how, how deep is that polyethylene service line? Typically about four and a half to five and a half feet. So it's above the frost line. Um, no, it's in the, it's in the wintertime that frost in a lot of areas and parking lots and stuff and driveways will freeze, uh, 10, 12 feet deep. So it's, uh, it's in frozen ground. A lot of our system, we figure well over 75% of our system sometimes spends the better part of winter in frozen ground. Um, we still have quite a few people on the call and I, I've promised to get this thing done by 20 minutes after the hour, but I've got a couple other questions. You mentioned that you thought um, you wish that you'd met us earlier. You know, you and I met each other this summer up in Fairbanks. What, what are the three biggest issues that you wish you knew that you know now that you wish you knew 10 years ago? Oh, well, for one, the pipe handling, the staging, um, some of the other materials and equipment that are available um, through McElroy, um, some of the other piping products uh, like this, this 36,000 foot water project, um, um, that's on the screen here now, you know, uh, we built our own trailer uh, for this. You'll see in the other picture to uh, transport the 50 foot lengths of pipe has drop down sides that we can roll onto the roller and, and put through the fusion process. Um, you know, some of the engineering, um, uh, but uh, probably primarily just kind of the um, network of uh, professionals to kind of sound ideas off of more than anything. Um, and our standards, we're still working on developing sound standards. Um, we have standards for a three quarter, one inch service connection. We have standards for um, uh, main extensions, but you know, there's still a, a lot of areas that we can improve our standards to give our uh, customers and uh, contractors other, you know, opportunities that would include uh, HDP pipe. So um, are you doing your own installations or are you bidding it all out? No, we do our own installations. Um, you know, 90, 98% of our uh, piping is put in in-house. Um, we did do a project last year where, you know, we contract out the directional drilling. Um, every now and then uh, there'll be a DOT project or something that'll use HDPE and uh, uh, like we did had an 18 inch river crossing of the Chena River. Um, that's done by a contractor, um, but overseen by us. And are you using electrofusion, Tariq? We are. We're using, I'm sorry, butt fusion and electrofusion. Yep. And have had uh, absolutely phenomenal results with uh, all of it. We've, uh, we've installed um, oh, 7,800 foot project, 30, or uh, 36,000 foot project, 64,000 foot project, um, four, six, up to 18 inch uh, main diameters, uh, thousands of feet in force, sewer force mains now um lift station rehabs and uh, we've only ever had two leaks and those were uh, uh contractor damage so what kind of mistakes did the contractor make to get two failures well uh probably not using a number two shovel um more and you relying on an excavator bucket to find our main <laughs> <laughs> but so you don't have trouble with your electrofusion saddles no, now we did. So our first pilot project, um, I, WL Pratt Plastics actually did a, a little uh, um, case study on it. And we were using the electric fuse saddles at that time. And then we were uh, fusing on poly valves. We got away from that after that project because it was so too time consuming. Um, we went to Romac um, uh, saddles with a corp stop and then a uh, swivel by flare adapter uh, by plain end. And so, you know, it doesn't require the generator be there or the fusion machine be there, um, you know, because we okay, can Okay, so that's a, that's a mechanical connection with a corporation that then connects to polyethylene. 
right? Correct. Yep. And yeah. we can have the spool um, all pre-built on a trailer and we bring it down and we tie on the swivel by flare adapters and then we start rolling it out to the property. So um, at this time, there's no fusing anything done um, at the saddle connection. Um, so it yeah, just- so Alan's, Alan's doing, pulling, excuse me, Alan's pulling that up nice and tight. So we can see that mechanical connection onto that polyethylene main. And then you've got the PEX uh, warming coil that runs yep. parallel with the polyethylene that has yep. been electrified. And that's all insulated in three inches of polyurethane foam. Ah, wow. Fantastic. And we, now, and we have had two services freeze. We have hundreds of services out there now. And uh, we've had two services freeze. And in both cases, the customer thought they'd save money when they went on vacation and didn't turn their uh, circ pump on. And the thaw method worked perfectly. Uh, it takes very little time to circulate hot water through that PEX line and thaw out those two HDPE service lines. Because again, all of our mains are circulated and the services have to be circulated too. When that water stops moving, it freezes. Well, I, I love the fact that it's working, but I'd recommend not using a mechanical, particularly within the frost line like that. Because after you retire, Tariq, <laughs> that'll be the first thing to fail because it's mechanical touching um, the polyethylene. Um, so I'd recommend uh, to my audience anyway, take the time to use electrofusion because it really does work and it's never going to fail on you. So, but I have okay. seen what Tariq is doing throughout the United States because it's more expeditious. It works and it works for a period of time, but it won't last as long as the polyethylene. Yeah, and the Electrofuse, so we were, we were advised by the gas company here in the beginning too during that first pilot project. And I'm not sure if there's gas folks on here, but we were told to avoid Electrofusion at all costs because if you're going to have a failure, that's where it's going to be. Well, we've also done a lot of testing and, uh, and I'll tell you what, um, I, you know, I firmly believe the Electrofuse uh, couplings and I mean, we're doing 14 inch you know, 18 inch, um, we have had absolutely zero trouble with any of them. Um, so I love you telling that story. So for our audience's benefit, what we've learned from utilities and municipalities like Tariq's that have adopted polyethylene in a major way, that if they do have failures, it's with an electrofusion saddle. Now the gas industry has used more electrofusion than anybody else in the world. And they do it judiciously with proper procedures and they rarely have failures. But when you compare a butt fusion to an electrofusion, um, in Amer North America anyway, an electrofusion is initially more complicated because it has a couple additional steps. But in Europe, that's their primary fusion method versus butt fusion. So it's just kind of interesting, depends on where you come from. Now, Tariq, I wanna respect my audience's time. Uh, one final comment on uh, maybe a thing that you wish you learned. Uh, but you've did a fantastic job today, and I, it makes me realize that we probably ought to do um, a, a case study webinar with you as one of our participants. Tariq, what else would you like to say today? Well, I guess if in final closing, you know, when I was a young operator and stuff, and I heard uh, other operators, uh, seasoned operators in the field, and the comment that was always made was, you know, this'll, this'll last until I'm out of here. And this'll last till I'm out of here, you know, this pipe repair, this pipe product or whatever. And uh, I just always thought, you know, um, once I started working with HDPE, I mean, I, I want things to last three or four generations, three or 400 years. And uh, I hope that, um, you know, in a hundred years or 50 years when uh, new operators are, still doing repairs and uh, this HDPE, um, we continue to have more of it installed that, uh, you know, they recognize the value um, and appreciate the time uh, that we put into starting this and using this. Um, you know, it's gonna save the company, it's gonna save our ratepayers, it's gonna save our investors um, uh, for years. Yeah, well said, I love it. Um, thank you very much, Tariq, for uh, putting that slide deck together and taking the time to spend with us on a webinar. And 
please contact us anytime with any issues you have with polyethylene. And hopefully you'll invite us back to Fairbanks next summer. Uh, I want to say thank you to Jim Johnston, Rick Ponder, Chris Waite, uh, Matt Hahn and Richard Colossa on questions and Aaron Davey and my team of Alliance engineers. Stay on at the end and answer Dan Landy's question. Uh, and then you can get your PDHs or your CEUs depending on uh, uh, what your interest is. We'll keep the line up for about five more minutes because we've got a couple more questions here we haven't answered yet. So uh, we will see you in um, February, the 7th and 8th in our next webinars. I want to say thank you all to our guests for hanging out with us here on this wonderful talk, Cold Fusion Weather Operations. Okay, bye for now. Answer the question at the end. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, Dan. Uh